During World War II, the deadly campaign by Germany's U-boat submarines against the convoys of Allied merchant ships became known as the Battle of the Atlantic. We did not know where the enemy was, and we were always told, as soon as the ship leaves the harbor, you're in enemy territory. The only thing between you and the pearly gates was that ship. With the U-boat sinking ships faster than they could be replaced, President Franklin Roosevelt ordered the mass production of a huge armada of austerity freighters. They were christened the Liberty Fleet. These ships were just unbelievable because there wasn't anything that they couldn't carry. When the Allied forces stormed ashore on D-Day to launch the assault on Hitler's Reich, it was only possible thanks to the mountain of war material delivered by the Liberty ships. Using archive film and color reenactments, Battle Stations tells the story of the most extraordinary feat of mass production ever attempted. The building of the Liberty ships. As Europe was overrun by German forces in 1940, only the British Isles managed to resist the invaders. The sea may have protected Britain, but it also cut her off from vital resources like oil. The war effort depended on imports, and without them, Adolf Hitler knew Britain would soon be powerless to resist. In the first nine months of the war, 150 ships were sent to the bottom. Most fell victim to Germany's Untersee, or U-boat submarine fleet. Soon they were being sunk faster than replacement ships could be built, and the nation was slowly but surely bleeding to death. In September 1940, the British government turned to America for help. President Franklin Roosevelt did not let them down. Our most useful and immediate role is to act as an arsenal for them as well as for ourselves. We shall send in ever-increasing numbers ships, planes, tanks, guns. That is our purpose and our pledge. To help ensure Britain's survival, America agreed to build 60 merchant ships based on a traditional British design with its origins in the 19th century. This antiquated type was chosen by the British government because it was quick to build, easy to operate and reliable. As the threat to world trade increased, America decided to replace its reserve of obsolete merchant ships by adopting a modified version of the British design. And so what they did, they come up with the idea of the engine, they come up with the idea of the ship, they had a model made, presented to Franklin Delano Roosevelt. He chuckled and said, well, it sure is an ugly duckling, but it'll get the job done. And of course, the ugly duckling stayed with it. To improve their image, Roosevelt's ugly ducklings were christened the Liberty Fleet. And September the 27th, 1941 was declared Liberty Day, with 14 new ships launched across the nation. Barely two months later, the United States was at war. Now the Battle of the Atlantic became America's fight as well. With confidence in our armed forces, with the unbounding determination of our people, we will gain the inevitable triumph, so help us God. And once they said they were at war, the guys joined the services, came off the farms, went to work in the shipyards and in the automobile plants and in the airplane plants. That's where everybody was working towards one end. And that was the preservation of what this country stood for and what we as Americans felt. Well, everybody wanted to do their part. For instance, uh, when I tell people that I went to sea at 16, Today, they say, how in the world did your mother ever let you do that? But that was the thing to do. Every day in every port, these unsung heroes of the Merchant Marine are signing up for service. For planes must be delivered overseas. 
Guns must be transported to new fronts. And trucks, 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 the lifeline of armies must reach the theaters of war with all possible speed. Now, American ships were being sunk in home waters and sunk at an alarming rate. In Germany, the returning U-boat crews were hailed as heroes. They called this the happy time. To beat the U-boat menace, President Roosevelt declared that America would mass produce a bridge of ships across the Atlantic. The operation was led by Henry Kaiser, a dynamic figure in the construction industry who had turned his talents to shipbuilding. What Henry Ford had done for automobiles, Henry Kaiser now did for ships. Kaiser's concept was to prefabricate sub-assemblies and assemble them on the building ways, superstructures, hull sections, and so on. Wherever, wherever these things could be sub-assembled, they were. And in fact, this is still being done today. The Kaiser Revolution was based on welding and prefabrication. By breaking down the hull into a series of sub-assemblies, which could be built independently, then craned into position, the whole process was speeded up. It was said of Kaiser that he built ships by the mile and chopped them off by the yard. It was like a, the new era of shipbuilding, and we didn't know it at the time. Every single operation was studied, and any process which could be eliminated was challenged. Why drill and rivet a plate if it can be welded? Why weld if it can be bent? Why bend if it can be left flat? Stage one, stage two, where do we build it? Got to find all these places close to the ocean, from Maine, clear down the East Coast, around the Gulf of Mexico, all the way up the West Coast, up into Oregon. They put the plans together, and they laid out 18 different shipyards. What we had to do was build a type of easily producible, mass producible cargo ship that could be built faster than they could be sunk. It, it was as brutally simple as that. But the policy of building expendable ships carried a very high price tag. And it wasn't just a matter of dollars and cents. The lives of their crew members were also at stake. That's the way war is. You have to keep fighting. You have to keep going. You can't always stop to save them. And that's one reason we have so many of our brother seafarers are at the bottom of the sea. Ships, ships, and more ships. The ships to carry the stuff to win a war. Tell the men who build them. Tell them they can do it. The boys need ships. The Liberty ship's the answer. By the start of 1942, America was geared up to build the largest merchant fleet in history, the Liberty Fleet. Building ships had always been a slow and complex business. The Liberties would have to be turned out in weeks and built by a largely unskilled labor force recruited from across the nation. Most of them had no experience in shipbuilding. A quarter of them had never even seen the sea. They were a group of people that were used to hard work. They knew how to work with their hands and they knew what long hours were. They came off the farms, went to work in the shipyards, and they were able to fit right into these type of jobs. So they had so much going for them to come into our industry and do the job that they were able to do. They were fascinating people. My number was uh, 29986, and generally there were about 15,000 people at one time that were working in that shipyard. You learn so fast, because you had to. You didn't have a choice. It was, it was thrown at you so fast. Each shipyard worked to a standard set of plans, giving exact dimensions for every part of the hull, right down to the smallest detail. Full-size wooden templates were made and used to mark out the steel sheets for cutting by oxyacetylene torch.
when you would go into a shipyard, the activity, oh gosh, it was just mind-boggling. Riveting, burning, sparks flying everywhere. Oh, gee. It was just massive steel every place you went. Big sections being prefabricated. They would lay them out there more or less like Erecta sets. Some of the sections even had the piping and a lot of the outfitting already put in down on the assembly area. When the ship started being erected on the ways, they would pick up these sections and take them on down there. As it went on, they kept building it on up until they finally got a ship. I don't think it was just a matter of going in the shipyard and earning a day's pay. You went there to help your cause. You worked a lot of extra time that you normally wouldn't. Uh, I can remember working 16, 18 hours a day and, and thought nothing of it and thought, well, if I can get this ship out on time, I, I did my part. At one of the famous Henry Kaiser shipyards, the Brock Miller family have established an amazing record in the annals of shipbuilding. Headed by the father, every one of the family's 15 adults, including the girls, is helping build America's Liberty ship. And these, these people came from more or less all walks of life. Uh, about a third of the people in that shipyard were women. The language in the shipyard was sometimes pretty rough. Sometimes you had to make your point by using profanity, and you kind of felt, I don't know, kind of embarrassed when you used this around a group of women. She had a shield over her head, and sometimes you didn't know if she was a woman or not. They were great people. They did a lot of things a woman wasn't even thought about doing. But they went and they did their part. Well, to me, that welding is one of the most miserable jobs. You're alone all the time underneath that hood. There's smoke continually around you. In the winter time, you're freezing to death because you got these leathers on to keep from getting burned. In the summertime, you're sweltering. I still got marks all up and down my arms from uh, the sparks that would come down on me and, and, and burn me. The only lull in this constant activity would come when the yard paused briefly to celebrate another launching. They would gather on around and there'd be a speech uh, that this ship was continuing to the war effort and that sort of thing. It wouldn't take very long. The woman would swing the bottle, she'd just throw the bottle at the thing, say, I christened thee the good ship so-and-so. The ship would go down the ways, then there'd be a big cheer, and then, then it would die off, and then people would go back to work. Turning out a liberty could be compared to building a 40-story skyscraper laid on its side. Each ship contained over 250,000 individual parts, and the hull was fixed together by some 43 miles of welding. There were about five miles of wire and seven miles of pipework. Yet despite all the resources poured into their construction, the liberties were regarded as expendable war material. Even a single transatlantic cargo run was reckoned to justify the construction cost of up to $2 million per ship. America was also fighting a war in the Pacific, which meant more supplies carried by more liberty ships. American shipyards would eventually produce more than 2,700 of them. All I know is it floated, it was a good ship, and uh, it served its purpose. And it was only made for one trip. That's all it was, one way with a, with a load of cargo. The American government and the media encouraged a spirit of friendly rivalry between the shipyards which soon became a cutthroat race against the clock for the all-time record. 48 days to build a ship. That's a world record. <laughs> Building a bridge of ships to win the war. A bridge of ships to ensure the peace. But 
but even this record was soon beaten. Welding and prefabrication were Henry Kaiser's winning formula. Through these methods, he breaks his own speed records time after time. 15 days from laying the keel to launching, then 10, then 7, until finally a ship is launched exactly four days, 15 hours and 29 minutes after its keel swings into place. Being publicity stunts, these schedules were untypical, but delivery within 50 days became commonplace, a fifth of the original schedule. With Henry Kaiser's help, American shipbuilding had come a very long way in a very short time. When you see that one that was launched uh, in four days and three days later it was on its way, this is unbelievable. But behind the record breaking and the patriotic headlines, there were voices of doubt. Was it really safe to send a crew and its vital cargo into the teeth of an Atlantic gale on a ship which had taken only a few weeks to build? Nobody doubted that the Liberty Fleet was a miracle of mass production, but many wondered if the ships were really up to the task of building Roosevelt's bridge over the troubled waters of the North Atlantic. By the start of 1943, America had truly become the arsenal of democracy, turning out the vast quantity of war material needed by the Allies. As the mass-produced Liberty Fleet steadily increased, so did the volume of cargo crossing the Atlantic to Britain. These ships were just unbelievable because there wasn't anything that they couldn't carry. I was on ships that carried airplanes. I was on ships that carried tanks, landing barges, as deck cargo. Forget about what we had below. You know, they carried the equivalent of 300 railroad cars in the holes. You name it, we, we carried it from baby diapers to tanks. Each Atlantic crossing was filled with danger, and nerves were always tense before a voyage. But for the young American sailors, it was also an adventure. You know, you, you feel you're indestructible. Nobody has hurt me. I'm 17, I'm 18, I'm 19, I'm 20. You're an old man. You're the old man of the group at 20. Fear, everybody's got a respect for fear. Everybody's got a respect for the unknown. And there was a lot of unknown out there. Anything that was below the waterline was unknown to you. Now, the Liberty ship became far more than just a mass of welded steel. When a ship is sitting there with nobody on it, it's a dead issue. Put one person aboard, and it gets life. Go ahead. And so you look at the ship as a living thing. You're living on it. It's doing things for you. It's taking you someplace. It's giving you an opportunity to do work. It's taking you to all the four corners of the world. Half ahead. Nothing that's dead and dormant can do that. So yeah, it's a living thing. Pull ahead. It seemed to breathe all the time. You know, we refer to it as she. You dress her up. You paint her, you take care of it. It's just like taking care of your house. And you don't want anything to happen to it. It's your home while you're at sea, and it's your security. They're leaving the protection of the harbor. Keen eyes must now be on the lookout for lurking submarines. Day after day, week after week, the convoys go through. We did not know where the enemy was, and we were always told, as soon as the ship leaves the harbor, you're in enemy territory. To give them some protection, the Liberty ships were armed, and the merchant seamen worked alongside a naval gun crew of up to 36 men. You had two different groups. You had the merchant marine who were all civilians, and all volunteers, and you had this gun crew. 
We were different generations in many cases, but we were doing one job, one ship, one group, taking one cargo to one place at one time, and that is the way we operated. But each ship was only a small part of a much greater operation, the convoy. The whole idea was to group vulnerable merchantmen together and give them some uh, warship protection to enable, give them a better chance to get through their voyage without being sunk by a submarine. A typical convoy would consist of 60 ships steaming on a broad front in a box formation. Outside the box, the anti-submarine escort ships would patrol. The entire convoy could span an area many miles across as it slowly plowed its way along, often at no more than seven or eight knots, about 10 miles per hour. They carried every type of cargo, but the most vital were usually the most dangerous. When we got on the ship, we went to Philadelphia. They loaded railroad rails in the bottom for ballast. Then we came to Baltimore and loaded gunpowder on up to the top. Since the two outer lines of ships were most vulnerable, fuel tankers and ammunition ships would usually be positioned near the center of the box. But on some convoys, they were banished to the most dangerous position of all. We were the last ship back and the last one on the side. Coffin Corner it referred to. I found out later the Paul Hamilton was loaded the same way. And it was torpedoed, it totally disintegrated. No survivors, no nothing. But I didn't know about that at the time. Hey, if it happens, you don't have a thing to worry about because it's there's going to be nothing left of anybody. And I don't think it's going to happen to me because we're going to bring this ship through. For the armed guard, Life became a constant vigil, watching the sea and the sky for the slightest sign of danger. You look out there and you see it's beautiful today. The sun is shining. Then it starts to change. A little bit of clouds, a little bit of haze, a little bit of fog, a little bit of rain. All those things change the area that you're looking at. When it changes, do you see something else out there? Is it a bird? Is it an airplane? Is it a broom handle floating out there? Is it a submarine periscope you see? Friend or foe, how do you know the difference? Just the sight of a U-boat, even if it was our own, would terrify me. And then, of course, you had the fear of getting sunk. And you knew that if you did, that your chances of survival were very slim. If you went in the water, you would only last a few minutes. The submarines have been out there since day one, and the submarines will be out there to the end of the war. There's no way you're going to get them all. And so you can never relax. I came off the wheel at 8 o'clock in the morning, and I went down to the mess room for my breakfast. It was a beautiful sunny day, and all of a sudden, I heard thunder. And I thought, my god, there's not a cloud in the sky. And at that moment, uh, the general alarm went off. And I ran out on deck, and on either side of us, uh, ships had been hit. Over on the starboard side, there was a tanker. I'd never seen anything like that. It was just, it must have been aviation gas because it was just one mass of flame. And I could see people running out of the midship house, maddened by the heat, of course, just running into the flames. And several other ships that had been hit were in the process of sinking or burning. Those things stay with you. You're, you know, you're, you're scared. You're, you, you know what can happen. 
Everybody knew that survival depended mostly on luck. No ship, however big and however well armed, could protect its crew from the grim reality of war at sea. An American convoy underway. Our fighters on every front rely on every ship in every convoy coming through on schedule. It takes ships to keep them fighting. As the convoy steamed across the vast expanse of open sea, the crews all felt the presence of their unseen enemy, the U-boats. Almost like living in a fishbowl, you always felt that they were out there watching you, waiting for an opportunity to strike. Unseen, unheard, unwelcome, and under us. But when you were down in the engine room, you'd think, here I am all the way down here, and the water line is up there. And if this ship gets hit before I get out of the engine room, I don't have much of a chance because the steam lines would break. And usually the engineers on watch, very rarely did they get out. They earned their money down there in that engine room. You guys had a lot of nerve down there. I'm wondering what's going on up top. I was scared to death what would happen below the ship line. And so I was happy being in my arm guard above the deck all the time. But the U-boats were not the only force which threatened the convoys. The icy waters of the North Atlantic could also become their enemy. No man knows how the sea will react. It can be calm one day and the, your worst enemy the next day. The ocean goes from smooth as glass, calm, a little bit of a rolling sea. The sea is now coming in on the bow. It's coming in on the stern. It's hitting your broadside. Then the sea gets a little bit heavier. You can look up and see the ocean above you, or look down 20, 30 feet below you and see the sea. That's when it's rough. That's when your propeller comes out and feels like it's tearing the ship apart. I was sure that they wouldn't make it when they'd roll over sometimes. I was sure that that was the last time she'd ever roll, that it wouldn't recover, but they did. It's horrendous. You'll have sometimes as much as 30 to 50 foot seas that you have to contend with. You're trying to make headway. You cannot make headway in a monstrous storm. You're lucky if you can hold your own. You have to slow down and let the sea take care of you. I've seen green water come over the bow many a time. And that's a big wave. Rough weather put a huge strain on the welded hulls of the Liberty ships. In very low temperatures, steel can become brittle. As they plowed through the icy waters of the North Atlantic, some of the Liberties showed an alarming tendency to crack. There were a few extreme cases of entire ships splitting from top to bottom with a deafening bang like a gunshot. There was extensive study done to try to figure out, all right, why is this happening? Uh, some, of it was, some of it was faulty welding, some of it was haste, some of it was inexperience. It was a learning process. And a, a, a process of reinforcement was put in place, and uh, the problem was essentially fixed. Anyone that talks about Liberty Ship bandies this about, that, that uh, oh, well, that cracked up and that broke in half. 2,700 ships didn't crack in half. Really, only a few of them cracked. But the Liberty's main problem was lack of speed. The convoy was most vulnerable at night, 
and a total blackout was strictly enforced. Under cover of darkness, a U-boat on the surface could travel at twice its submerged speed, about 20 miles per hour, and easily outpace the convoy while selecting its victims. The night is an altogether different world. You step out into the darkness. It's your turn to go on duty. You look out there, you try to see. Is the sky full of stars? Is there a full moon tonight? Is there a partial moon? Can we see horizon? I think the worst of it was staring through binoculars for four hours. You feel like something pulling your eyes out. That really is good to you. It's calm, it's peaceful, but you're scared to death. You don't know what's out there. And many, many of the sinkings happened at night, and so you can never relax. Then all of a sudden you see a silver streak running on top of the water. Within feet of the ship, I think it's a torpedo, but no explosion. A porpoise, a porpoise. And your heart, which has been racing, takes another hour to slow down. Damn fish. And a minute ago, I pulled the alarm on that one. Better safe than sorry, I guess. But, but the rest of the watches was basically boring and fighting sleep. Crew members would spend four hours on duty, eight hours off duty. After you finished your watch, you'd uh, go down and take a shower real fast and then get dressed and go to bed. <laughs> and of course, you had your life jacket right there. So you were always prepared. So now you had your four hours on duty. Now you got a chance to go to sleep, maybe? Ah. They put you right over the propeller. You're right above the aft steering compartment down there. You hear every little move. When the ship's pitching, the propeller comes out of the water. The whole damn thing shakes, rattles, noise is unbelievable. Between that and you're wondering what's going on outside, you just don't relax. In fact, we slept with our clothes on. Light preserver for a pillow. That ain't a nice way to sleep either. Yes, there was a lot of noise on the ship, a little creak here, a little groan there from the ship, but it became part of your music that you heard. That sounded like a violin putting you to sleep after a while. That noise didn't bother you a bit. In fact, is when it stopped, you came right awake. Silence. Silence is the worst. You're dead in the water. Nothing's moving. Why are you dead in the water? You've got a problem. If you had to leave the convoy for some reason, if you had engine trouble, they'd just leave you, and you became a straggler. Quite often, the U-boats would trail the convoys and uh, wait for something like that. That was the loneliest feeling in the world, to, to see the ships leave you. And then all of a sudden, you're out there all by yourself. You see that convoy moving away from you, and of course, the escorts don't stay with you either. They move on, too. They have to take care of the convoy. So you just hope for the best. Any ship that dropped out of a convoy was vulnerable, and it was vital to make running repairs as quickly as possible. The Liberty engine could usually be fixed thanks to the ingenuity of the engineers. A steam line breaks, and within a very short period of time, it's repaired. And I've seen things happen at sea where, the, you know, you feel, oh, man, they got to call in specialists. Somebody sits down, takes a look at it, and he says, well, I think we can do this. And they work at it, and it's done. But with a maximum speed of only about 11 knots, the Liberty crew would need plenty of time to rejoin the convoy. 
and time was not on their side. Pull ahead. Now, that dependable old steam engine would have to run flat out if the ship was to catch up before the U-boats closed in for the kill. It happens. It's best not to think about it because it'll just unnerve you. Well, it was scary. You couldn't see them, of course. That was the scary thing, and you never knew when they were going to attack. Most of the convoys that I was in were under attack at one time or another. The only thing between you and the pearly gates was that ship. chances were diminished. So I can remember just saying, OK, stay calm. You've got to go here. This is what you've got to do. And you would do it. You realize the first thing when they sound abandoned ship, of course, is to get to your boat station, and that the important thing is to remain calm and do your job. You were aware of people around you, but the important thing was you was survival, of course. We got two of the lifeboats away on the starboard side. The ship was sinking, and uh, there was some burning, too. But the boat got away, and we just sat there until the next morning. It's a lonely feeling when it gets daylight and you're sitting there all by yourself, not a thing in sight. Yet even in this cold and hostile battlefield, the hidden enemy could sometimes show a human face. We were still in the boat and we met this U-boat. And he'd come over and uh, he spoke perfect English, young German man, 28, 29 years old, skipper. First thing he said to us, he said, anybody sick or wounded? He said, I'll take him. He said, I can't take all of you. No, he was all right then. So he said, do you need anything? So the second mate was in charge of the boat, George Hurley. We just had finished a breaker of water that morning. So he said, yeah, he said, we need water. Give us a breaker of water. He gave us a, a, a bag of blankets and a box of biscuits that he'd sell. All this is stuff he'd salvaged off ships that he'd sunk. He said, well, he said, I can't help you anymore. He said, I got a business to tend to. Goodbye. And he went, so long, so long. And that was it. As the German U-boats continued to take their toll on Allied shipping, victory in the Battle of the Atlantic seemed as elusive as ever. But things were beginning to change. Late in 1942, the British had cracked the U-boat's coded signals. By the spring of 1943, the tables were slowly but surely being turned. With every resource in their control, the United States and Great Britain are fighting the Battle of the Atlantic. Shipbuilding figures have jumped from 1942's 8 million tons to 16 million planned for 1943. For the U-boat crews, the happy time would soon be over. By the summer of 1943, the Allies had developed powerful radar sets which could detect a submarine on the surface at a range of 10 miles, even in total darkness. Not only has detection apparatus been amazingly improved, 
Depth charge efficiency is greater and more deadly. Tons of TNT rain down on Hitler's raiders from navies, determined to protect the vital Allied war supplies. And below the water, Nazi sailors and equipment are blown to kingdom come. More and more liberties were delivering their precious cargo and returning safely to the United States for another load. The greatest feeling in the world is coming back in. And I don't care where you came to. If you lived in the middle of the country and you were able to get back to a West Coast port or an East Coast port or a Gulf Coast port, you were back in the United States. That was one hell of a great feeling. But for the U-boat crews, there were fewer happy homecomings now. During the month of May 1943, 41 U-boats were lost. More than one a day were vanishing off the map, and most went down with all hands, as so many of their victims had. The hunters had become the hunted. Meanwhile, every Liberty ship that safely delivered its cargo drove another nail into the coffin of the Third Reich. By the start of 1944, the steady flow of men and supplies to Britain had become a tidal wave. And on June the 6th, the Allies launched Operation Overlord, the D-Day invasion. The liberation of Europe had begun. One year later, it ended in the ruins of Berlin with the Allied victory. The Battle of the Atlantic really consisted of two things, the anti-submarine war and cargo carrying, hauling enormous tonnages of everything conceivable from, well, as the saying goes, from a pin to a locomotive, only in enormous quantities. And the Liberties did this. They didn't do it in a flashy or spectacular way, but they did it. They were a large part of our victory in the Battle of the Atlantic, and we shouldn't forget that without that victory in the Battle of the Atlantic, Operation Overlord would never have happened. The Allies would never have gone into Western Europe, and we can only try to imagine what the world would look like if that had not happened. Most of the 2,700 Liberties survived the war and went on to form the backbone of the world's merchant fleet, playing a key role in post-war reconstruction. But eventually salt water, rust and the passing years did what Hitler's U-boats had failed to do. By the 1970s, most of Roosevelt's bridge of ships had finally gone to the breakers. Finished with engines. Today, there are just two working survivors. The John W. Brown, preserved in Baltimore Harbor on America's Atlantic coast, and the Jeremiah O'Brien in San Francisco on the Pacific. They may be ugly ducklings, but Europe's freedom was secured by the men and equipment transported in hundreds upon hundreds of ships exactly like these, the Liberty ships. And if you really want the truth, we didn't really win the war, we outproduced them. It was fascinating that these workhorses were able to do the job and were dependable, primarily because the people that were pushing them were dependable. They were just the difference between winning and losing. If we didn't have them, we would have won. I mean, there's just no doubt about it.
Well, I'll tell you, life aboard a Liberty ship in World War II was never dull and never monotonous. As you well know that the ship was run by civilians, the Merchant Marine, and we were a military unit attached to the United States Navy. We were called the Armed Guard, and our job was only to protect the ship, its cargo, and its crew. We had nothing to do with running the ship. And a lot of people say, well, gosh, you guys didn't do anything. It had to be kind of monotonous to be aboard a Liberty ship out at sea for weeks, maybe months at a time. And again, I can tell you, it was not monotonous. Because when you look back in those days, we did not have any radar on these ships. We did not have any sonar on these ships. We did not know where the enemy was. And we were always told, as soon as the ship leaves the harbor, you're in enemy territory. Now, as I said, Merch Marine ran the ship. We took care of the guns and the equipment. But we also stood sea watches 24 hours around the clock. And if we had a full crew aboard, it meant that we were able to put men, two on the bow, two on the bridge, and two in the stern. Each were assigned a perimeter. And that way, we covered 360 degrees of the ship. We were able to look at the sky and the ocean at all times. Normally, you served four hours on and eight hours off, which seems like a good deal. Monotonous, looking at the sky, when you look out there, and you see it's beautiful today. The sun is shining. Then it starts to change. A little bit of clouds, a little bit of haze, a little bit of fog, a little bit of rain. All those things change the area that you're looking at. The ocean goes from smooth as glass, calm, a little bit of a rolling sea. The sea is now coming in on the bow. It's coming in on the stern. It's hitting your broadside. All these things change the symmetry as you're out there. So from a low situation where you can see everything, calm sea to a rolling sea, then the sea gets a little bit heavier. You start to be in these big droughts where you can look up and see the ocean above you or look down 20, 30 feet below you and see the sea. That's when it's rough. But in each of these areas, the symmetry that you're looking at, the scenery that you think you see out there is changing. And when it changes, do you see something else out there? Is it a bird? Is it an airplane? Is it a broom handle floating out there? Is it a submarine periscope you see? Friend or foe, what are they? How do you know the difference? Where's this experience come from? And the night, the night is an altogether different world. You step out into the darkness. It's your turn to go on duty. You take off your night vision glasses. You have your helmet on your life jacket. You never go any place on the ship without your life jacket or your helmet on when you're on duty. And your field glasses or your binoculars, whatever you want to call them. And it's nighttime. You look out there, you try to see. Is the sky full of stars? Is there a full moon tonight? Is there a partial moon? Is there no moon? Can we see horizon? Can we fix on what we want to look at? What's our area? What's it doing tonight? Then all of a sudden, you see a silver streak running on top of the water. Within feet of the ship, panic fell sets in. You think it's a torpedo. Not a chance to turn the alarm. But no explosion. A porpoise, a porpoise. And your heart, which has been racing, takes another hour to slow down. These are the things that make it not monotonous, and it's not dull. So now you've had your four hours on duty. Now you got a chance to go to sleep, maybe? Ah. But then, at sunup, you go on general quarters. Every morning, you have general quarters. As the day is changing from night to daytime, maybe an hour is spent on general quarters, maybe a little bit more, a little bit less. And then in the evening, you have general quarters again as you're going from daylight to nighttime. And these are the two times of the day when the ship is really vulnerable to submarines. Extra alert at this particular time. 
And now it's over. And now you got a chance to, hey, get some sleep. Perhaps write a letter to mom. You got to do your wash, too. Yeah, you got to eat sometime, too. And above all, you got to keep your equipment in tip top shape. So every day is overtime day. Every day on a livery ship is a full day. You get used to seeing the same picture in front of you. And when that changes, no matter how slight, you pick it up immediately. It's a sixth sense, yes, definitely a sixth sense. It's protection, it's gut feeling. You know that you can't ignore it. You've got to find out what it is. And you're better off pulling the alarm and saying, whoops, I'm sorry I made a mistake, than saying, let me look at it a little while longer and be sorry. Well, you know, you, you feel you're indestructible. Nobody has hurt me. I'm 17, I'm 18, I'm 19, I'm 20. You're an old man. You're the old man of the group at 20. Fear, everybody's got a respect for fear. Everybody's got a respect for the unknown. And there was a lot of unknown out there. Anything that was below the waterline was unknown to you. Interesting, there was a lot of armed guards who had no idea what an engine room looked like. I know I never went down during the war. I'm telling you, there was no way I could have been below decks. That was my mentality, you know. And from what they tell me, there's a lot of engineers would never come up above deck, but didn't want to be handlers, didn't want to be in gun tubs. I respect that because I was scared to death what would happen below the ship line. And so I was happy being in my arm guard above the deck all the time. Well, you know, when you had the arm guard, you had, you had probably the, uh, the best quarters on the ship. They put you right over the propeller, right over the, the rudder. So every time the ship turned, you heard the, the, uh, the, the propeller come out of the water, or, you, or as the, the heavier the sea, the more the propeller come out of the water, or you heard the, uh, the rudder moving back and forth as you're changing course. But you know what? That sounded like a violin putting you to sleep after a while. That noise didn't bother you a bit. In fact, is when it stopped, you came right awake. So yes, there was a lot of noise on the ship, a little creak here, a little groan there from the ship, but it became part of your music that you heard. And I don't remember any superstitions, to be honest with you. However, I can remember something that I don't know whether they were doing it on purpose or not, but I can remember this old merchant seaman, he would always get in there and, and, and take ice cold salt water showers. And finally somebody said to him one day, what are you doing that for? Why do you always have an ice cold salt water shower? And he said, well, you kids don't understand it. He said, but we're going through Cape Hatteras in the next couple of days, and when we get through there, he said, if there's a German submarine, I'm going to be ready for the water. You guys will not be ready for it. That may not have been a superstition, but he sure scared the hell out of a lot of us. <laughs> no, we're not. We were out there all by ourselves. Uh, in fact, uh, what people don't realize is probably, probably most of, of the time at sea on these ships, you were run on escorted. You were out there all by yourself. And, of course, that, that was one of the reasons why the sinkings of our merchant ships were so high in the beginning of the war. Uh, in my particular case, uh, I only spent three days in convoy. And they were, they were scary days. I was, uh, I was happy when I was running alone because I didn't hear the escort ships running up and down the convoy with the sirens going and dropping depth charges. You know, you're in there and you think, man, the fox is in the chicken coop. He's, he's here. You can't do anything about it. You can't see. That excitement is excitement that I didn't like. the stuff for war, the fists and muscles and guns and tanks and planes that smashed the Luftwaffe.
broke the panzers and ground to dusty rubble the bastion cities of the Bakhtam Rhine. Then their course was westward to deal with heaven's sons as they did with sawdust Caesars. To hurl this might across two hemispheres, a first task loomed on which all others hung. Grim, trim, determined Admiral Land pronounced it. Burned the phrase into our ears, remember? Ships, ships, and more ships. The ships to carry the stuff to win a war. Give thanks for this piece of paper. It's the Magna Carta, the Bill of Rights, the green light for the creation of an American merchant marine. It bought five years of time. Time to put together the men with the know-how, the brains, the practical experience to plan the fleet that carried the stuff for war. The bomb burst at Pearl Harbor punched the clock of destiny into undreamt of speed, picked off moments for decision. Up the production schedule, the new kind of ship, what design, who can build power plants for it, settle quick, standardize mass production, prefabrication. The Liberty ship's the answer. How fast can they come? What's the army need? What are the Navy specifications, aircraft carriers? Modify, change, use the C3s, how deep a draft, how long, what beam, diesel, turbine, more speed, convert for troops. Tell the men who build them, tell them they can do it. The boys need ships, 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 and more ships. And from Maine to Texas, Puget Sound to Mexico, the shipyards grew from timber piles and steel. From smoke-black cities far from the sound of the sea flowed the 100,000 different items which fitted together produce a ship. Thick steel chains from the furnaces of Illinois Anchors from the iron molds of Pittsburgh. Wide-mouthed ventilators to gulp the welcome air for the engine watch within the pulsing holds. Life rafts, lifeboats piled high against the time the endless waters claim their share of war. These are porthole covers. Acres of machinery somewhere made them, shipped them to the sea. Enough cable to wrap around the world. Bronze for hero statues can come later. Now these propellers will twist their way through every ocean. Hatch covers, slabs of steel from Birmingham, hammered hot from the smoky roar of Bessemers, poured out and cooled and piled like pancakes. Remember Helen and her thousand ships? Was not her face, but the faces of America that launched this mighty armada. Ships, ships, and more ships. Hear their answer. It was done. a world of heat and flame, flame to bend the sullen steel to shape. They learned to fabricate the strange new forms conceived in blueprints made from shapeless steel, to use new tools to keep the structures moving to their appointed places, to blend the steel with the fiery finger of the welding torch. That's Mary Smith behind the mask. Her young husband was busy on Okinawa at the moment. There goes another. This happened five times each day for 730 days, two years, remember? But we all know that a ship is not only steel and iron, wood and fabrics and plastics. What has a name must have heart and soul and purpose. It has life in it. Therefore, we celebrate, if only for a moment, the birth of every single ship, and this is eminently fitting and proper. A real welcome came when the little fellows bustled up to meet her. The sea mule, blunt-nosed and stubby, sturdily nudges the big ship's still immobile mass into the wet docks for the final chores. Here she'll join her fellows. A multitudinous orderly rush of workmen install companionways, transmitters, navigation equipment, control boards, tables and chairs, the web of rigging for the cargo gear, 
bunks, signal flag lockers, pots and pans and stoves, stanchions and davits make ready the ships to the last and final rivet. Somebody has pulled a switch, pressed a button, turned a valve, but the last moment has been reached. She's straining at the hawsers for her trial in the sea. There she goes, the Liberty, another of those ships that bear the names like Clarion Calls to Freedom. From Patrick Henry stemmed this fleet, cargo for a world enslaved, Liberty. For our enemies, death. Building a fleet of cargo ships was done. That was task number one.